afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm Karen Carr, and on behalf of our Grand Rounds team, I'd like to welcome both our live and virtual audiences today. Today, we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Paul Koch. He's the assistant professor and neurosurgeon with the VCU Department of Neurosurgery. I'd also like to take this time to acknowledge and extend a warm welcome to the faculty, the staff, and the residents of the VCU Department of Neurosurgery who are attending virtually to support Dr. Koch. Today's title is MRI Guided Focused Ultrasound for Essential Tremor, a new incisionless outpatient procedure. Dr. Paul Koch is a board certified fellowship trained neurosurgeon in Richmond, Virginia, who specializes in surgery for movement disorders, including focused ultrasound and deep brain stimulation for essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, as well as surgery for refractory epilepsy. He joined BCU Health in 2018 after completing residency training at University of Pennsylvania and fellowship training in stereotactic and functional neurosurgery at Emory University. I'd like you to join me in providing a warm welcome today to Dr. Paul Koch. All right. <clears throat> thank you very much, Karen. I'm going to try to share my screen and thank you to the whole internal medicine department for uh, having me today and for the time you're all taking to hear about some of our exciting procedures that we're doing in neurosurgery. I'm going to just give me a second to share my screen in the right way. Right. And now what I need to do. Sorry, everybody. Give me one second. Okay. Does it still look appropriate? Yes. Okay. Good noon. Hopefully everybody is having lunch or had lunch. Um, so I, uh, I'm one of the functional neurosurgeons, as she mentioned, and I want to talk with you today about uh, surgical options that we have for patients with essential tremor, and in particular, our newest procedure called focused ultrasound, uh, which is an outpatient procedure that we do without anesthesia and without making incisions, um, and that is turning out to be a, a, a very effective therapy for tremor patients. And I, I thought that it would be worthwhile to, to present this to this group because I know that a lot of patients with essential tremor either are not interested in or are not referred to a, a specialist in neurology for, for one reason or the other, and that a lot of uh, internal medicine folks are managing the medications for essential tremor. And part of that may be because there's never really been a, a medication that is designed or was indicated for essential tremor. It's always borrowed classes of meds from other, for uh, other reasons. And so uh, I think it, I thought it'd be worthwhile to talk with you guys. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to advance this. That doesn't work. Will this work? All right, I don't have any disclosures as of yet. I'm still only five years into practice. So, as I'm sure you all know, essential tremor, we also call it familial tremor, idiopathic tremor, or a benign tremor. Um, it, in, it involves involuntary shaking, most commonly in the hands or the arms, but it can also involve the legs, and at times it can also involve the head and neck, and sometimes the voice. We distinguish it from tremor associated with Parkinson's disease, for example, because uh, essential tremor is a postural or an action tremor. That is when your limb, for example, moves to do some action or is held in a in a um, in a non-resting postural position. That's when the tremor uh, comes out. And when the arm, for example, is at rest, there is no tremor, which is the opposite of the resting tremor typically seen in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we know that there's a strong hereditary or genetic component to essential tremor in about half of cases. And importantly, it's a progressive disease, uh, we think that it involves the cerebellar, what's called the cerebellar outflow track. Uh, and so it's a, it's a process that involves potentially the cerebellum or other nodes along that pathway in the, in the motor system. And it can progress 
from a very mild shake that affects a younger person to a very severe tremor that can interfere with all activities of daily living and requiring up to full and total assistance. It's pretty common, about 7 million in the country, about a 1.3% prevalence. That goes up as, uh, as the, we talk about uh, older populations and over the age of 60, it's about a 6% prevalence. <clears throat> and like I've alluded to, the first line of therapy is medication. And we borrow from other classes such as beta blockers and other anti-epileptic medications, propranolol, primidone being the, the mainstays along with topamax. When those don't work or they cause significant side effects, uh, some patients will find some benefit from Botox injections. And then there are the surgical therapies for medication refractory epilepsy. And that, for many of the last decades, the, and still the gold standard has been deep brain stimulation. Um, but now giving DBS really a run for its money, in some cases, is this focused ultrasound procedure. And we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk about both of those. <clears throat> but I wanted to point out that you know, we have a mismatch between patients that have severe disabling tremor and those that seek uh, surgical intervention. So many patients uh, don't respond to the medications. And we know that even those who do, they still have a, uh, they still have significant impairment in quality of life or their functional ability. One notable study showed that about a third of patients will discontinue their, their medications, including a third of those that are considered severe tremors. And that's either because the meds are ineffective or they're causing intolerable side effects. Um, this, th there are two points to show on this graph here. So first is just an illustration from this study uh, that the disease and the disability associated with it worth worsens with the length of time that you have the disease. So this graph shows on the y-axis is the percentage of patients that have a particular disability and the individual bars that are shaded differently are different durations of having the disease. And then on the x-axis, are if you can't see it on the screen because it's kind of small writing, are different disability categories such as trouble with writing, drinking, using a spoon, shaking of the head, embarrassment, um, and how many are using medications. And then importantly, the, the yellow box circles the end there, and that is the percentage of patients in each disease duration category that undergo surgery for essential tremor. So we know that 10% of patients will become completely incapacitated, but by the second or the third decade of, of tremor disease, you're, they're we're approaching 50% or so of patients, depending on the category, are having significant disability. Yet despite that high rate of disability, only about 10%, uh, regardless of, of duration category, are undergoing any type of procedure. So why is there, well, we need better education for patients, um, better education for providers on what the surgical options are, when it's appropriate, and what the risks and potential benefits may be, because the idea of surgery, of course, can be an understandably frightening one. And so at VCU in particular, um, well, I would say, you know, one of the one of the things that I'd recommend is an early referral to a movement disorder center. And here at VCU, that's the PMDC um, in the neurology department. But in particular, particularly since we're launching this focused ultrasound program, uh, I would encourage you if there's anyone that you think may benefit at least from a discussion of the options, please refer, you can refer directly to neurosurgery. You know, there are no barriers set up where we have to have seven neurologists sign on the dotted line before we'll see them. Um, please go ahead and refer them even if it just ends up being a discussion. <clears throat> but importantly, and this is where focused ultrasound, I think is, is filling and uh, helping to fill this gap. Um, there are many patients who for medical comor comorbidity reasons or just for preference would never consider having permanent electrodes implanted into their brain or devices implanted in their body. They would not consider DBS or they cannot get it for medical reasons. And I think focused ultrasound because of its outpatient nature, its lack of implants and so forth could be an attractive alternative to some patients and really it's allowing us to reach 
more people who may benefit from this and see it in a significant improvement in their quality of life than we were otherwise able to reach before. <clears throat> so what are the surgical options? Deep brain stimulation, the gold standard, which has been there for, been with us for decades. This is where we implant electrodes into the thalamus, to the uh, VIM nucleus of the thalamus, and those electrodes deliver electrical stimulation that disrupts that circuit that begins, we think, in the cerebellum and travels through a never, number of nodes into the motor pathways in the brain. And it is extremely effective in disrupting tremor. It does not prevent the progression of the disease. It only treats the symptoms. But we have a lot of flexibility, a lot of things we can do with DBS. So the amount of stimulation, its timing, the shape of the cloud of electrical current or the shape of the volume of tissue that re that it reaches can be shaped with something called directional leads that we have now. And those things can all be adjusted over time, both to optimize therapy potentially as the disease progresses and as well to, to minimize side effects. Um, and, and it's really this reversibility quote of DBS that has made it, you know, the gold standard because by and large, any side effects that you may see are from the stimulation. And if you turn the stimulation off in the worst case scenario, you can eliminate those side effects. And we have lots of ways to program around side effects to still get benefit. So it, it's a very flexible and powerful, um, powerful uh, tool. And really, it replaced an older therapy, which was creating a, a lesion or literally burning a hole in the same place in the thalamus, which we would call a thalamotomy, uh, which was also extremely effective in treating tremor. But it, as you can imagine, was irreversible. So if you got side effects, those tended to be permanent. The degree of tremor control that you got tended to be fixed. And because of the side effect profile, it was really frowned upon to treat both sides of the brain. It, the, the risk of having weakness, difficulty with speech, et cetera, and swallowing uh, was high when you treated both sides. So that generally wasn't done. That all changed with DBS. We are able to treat both sides uh, very confidently. But both procedures gave a 70 to 80% improvement in tremor. Now, the flip side, of course, of deep brain stimulation is that it's a major, it's a major uh, neurosurgical operation. You know, there's a risk of infection because you have permanent implants in the body, about a two to five percent chance of that. There's a perioperative risk of having a hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke, which we estimate to be about one percent. Patients need to stop any uh, antiplatelet or uh, anticoagulation medications for several weeks. Uh, it requires general anesthesia. It requires a multi-day hospital stay. There are incisions. There are permanent wires. Uh, and these things need ongoing maintenance. So batteries need to be replaced or rechargeable batteries need weekly charging. There may be programming changes. So you know these are the, the flip side of what having a DBS system entails. And you can imagine some patients either out of preference or out of medical comorbidities, this may not be a great option for them. Um, so what is focused ultrasound? It is a new technology or combination of newer technologies for performing the old procedure being a thalamotomy. So we are still creating a lesion. We are back to creating a lesion in the brain, but we do it in a safer and more precise way. Here's a bit of a history. This is not, you know, out of the blue. First, it was first noted that ultrasound waves were killing fish. Uh, that were these ultrasound waves being uh, emitted from submarines all the way back in the 1910s. Uh, brain lesions have been made in the, uh, using ultrasound since the 1940s. The difference then was that uh, a craniotomy had to be performed, so the skull had to be removed and the brain exposed in order to do these things. The advances of technology have has eliminated that necessity. Um, the first modern focused ultrasound uh, Lesion was done in 2009, and that was for pain. It was approved for essential tremor, as well as tremor dominant Parkinson's disease in 2016, 2018. And we were just not that long ago approved for pallidotomy, a different target in the brain for treatment of Parkinson's disease. That's not going to be a focus of this talk, but I'm happy to talk with that about anybody who's interested. And then most recently, the technology has been approved to treat both sides of the brain for essential tremor. So again, new technology. So this is a procedure we perform in an MRI scanner. Uh, and 
that allows us, and we'll, I'll talk about this on, uh, in the next slide, to monitor the lesion that's being created in real time. So compared to a classic radio frequency approach, which is the old way of doing a thalamotomy, this new technique you know, enables more precision and accuracy. There's no incision, uh, so there's no wound healing issues. Um, it, the safety profile is better. The perioperative risk profile is better. And uh, there's no need for general anesthesia or any anesthesia at all. There's no implanted hardware and patients go home within several hours after the uh, after they show up in the morning. However, it is still a permanent lesion. Let's go on to the next slide. So this is just a little fancy uh, uh, animation from the company that produces the focus ultrasound machine. Um, basically the way the procedure goes is the patient is uh, put into a head frame that holds the head fixed. And that head frame is bolted into this helmet, the specialized helmet looking device, and then loaded into the MRI scanner. And then we plan a, a precise location within the thalamus. <laughs> and then about a thousand or so ultrasound, individual ultrasound waves are directed from that helmet towards a, that target within the brain. And the idea is that any one of those ultrasound waves does not have enough energy to cause any damage and is able to pass through the this, this skin, the skull, other soft tissue, you know, portions of the brain you're not targeting. And they all meet at that one precise point and where they meet enough energy accumulates to, cause, to, to create a lesion. And this is how you can perform the procedure without any incisions. And because there are no pain receptors, ironically, within the brain, there's no pain associated with the lesion itself. Right. So again, two key safety features uh, that really make this an advance over radio frequency ablation. So one, number one, the MRI, uh, doing this in the MRI allows you to see the shape and location of the lesion as it's being created. And the way that we do this is we perform the procedure in steps. So we first deliver a very low amount of energy, just enough to, to show up on the MRI. And then we can make adjustments if it's not targeting where we want it to be. We can move the, move the target. We then increase the energy slightly to a point where we seem to be able to create a temporary lesion, meaning we disrupt the transmission of, of neural signals enough to see whether we're getting a benefit on tremor, and more importantly, whether we're getting any side effects, such as tingling in the hand or face, um, and if we are, we can make adjustments again and not at that point worry that these changes will be permanent. So in between each delivery of energy, which we call a sonication, we're able to go in back into the scanner, pull the patient out and ask them, are they having any side effects? Uh, evaluate their tremor, usually by having them draw on a piece of paper. And so by doing it in this stepwise way, moving from a temporary lesion and then ultimately turning the energy up high enough to create a permanent le lesion, um, we dramatically improve the, the accuracy and the safety of the procedure. So what about outcomes? What outcomes can we expect? So with DBS, we expect about a 70 to 80% improvement in tremor for all comers. Some people get more, but about 70 to 80% is about what we can expect. The data on focused ultrasound is very promising. So, and when we talk about outcomes in tremor, we have to be careful about comparing apples to apples. So there are many ways to assess and measure tremor. You can talk specifically about the postural tremor. You can talk specifically about the action tremor, or you can combine them all into a combined tremor score. And so if you look at the postural tremor uh, in the, in the, in the, primary studies that uh, led to this being adopted widely as a therapy, um, about 73% improvement in postural tremor was achieved after a year, and that seemed to be durable out to at least five years. And five years is really the extent of the data that we have at this point in any sort of organized way. And that is, is the major unknown when compared to DBS. So DBS, we have decades of data suggesting that this is durable and programming adjustments can make this last for many, 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 many years. If we look at the combined tremor score, score so that includes resting tremor, postural tremor, action tremor, 
then the number is about 55% improvement at a year. And there may be some diminution of that at five years down to 40%. <clears throat> so a suggestion that there may be a fading benefit um, after five years and that combined score. But again, this is this, this is favorable, this is comparable to, to DBS and what we see. So the other important aspect is what are the side effects or the potential complications that we can see with this? And that is a little bit different than DBS. So whereas with DBS, tingling or paresthesias in the hand, difficulty with gait, difficulty with speech and swallowing, all of those things, if they are going to happen, tend to be reversible. Um, uh, but complications such as infection, um, device failure, uh, complications related to inserting something into the brain, so a hemorrhage or a stroke risk, all of those things are non-existent in focused ultrasound, but present in DBS. But the profile of that adverse events we see with focused ultrasound, again, a bit different. So about one third of patients will have a temporary gait disturbance that can last days to weeks after the procedure. And that can range anything from a subjective sense that my gait or my balance is off to a true weakness that requires some assistive technology to get over. And then thankfully, most of that improves about to about 10%, nine or 10% will have some degree of permanent trouble with gait. So this becomes important when selecting patients. If there are people who have pre-existing gait trouble at baseline, this may not be a great option for them. Then the other major adverse event we talk about is, again, about a third of patients will, will get paresthesias, numbness and tingling, either around the mouth or in the hand. And that fades to, in the trial, about 14% permanent uh, such uh, side effect. But I think that number now is lower. So since that trial, we've been able to tweak um, and improve the targeting by moving the lesion a, a bit more superior. And that has cut down on the numbness and tingling. So while the official number is 14% there, I think it's actually a bit less. The gait disturbance seems to be, that seems to be reproducible, about 10% of patients. Um, again, uh, there are there are certain uh, side effects that can happen around the time of the procedure, dizziness, taste disturbance, et cetera. All of that improves after the procedure is over. <clears throat> so when should you consider referring a patient to neurosurgery for discussion of a focused ultrasound or for deep brain stimulation? Well, the tremor needs to be considered moderate or severe, and that's on any number of rating scales out there. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think that, it, you know, I don't think it's necessary for you to do some sort of tremor rating scale in clinic, but I, you know, someone who's got a, a noticeable tremor. And in my mind, the most more important thing is, is it significantly interfering with their life? So is it causing a, a, a significant functional disability or, or is it interfering with an important activity in their life? So for example, we had a patient who largely seemed to be unbothered by the tremor until she went to perform, she was very into crafts and into knitting and sewing, and that was a huge part of her life. And when she went to do those specific activities, her tremor was quite severe. And she underwent the procedure and, and has been able to return to those activities. So in, in my mind, the critical thing is really how much is this interfering with your life and what you want to be able to, or need to be able to do. And then you need to have failed at least two medications, two first-line medications uh, for essential tremor. And then, of course, the patient needs to be willing to consider surgery either DBS or focused ultrasound to treat their tremor. So th that is, they need to themselves think it's bad enough to consider these things. Who should consider focused ultrasound over DBS? Well, if they're not a DBS candidate, but they're too unhealthy to safely undergo general anesthesia or have a multi-day hospital stay, um, or they need to minimize their time off of blood thinners, you know, their risk of coming off is much too high for a period of weeks. <clears throat> or their high infection risk, or the patient would never consider permanent implants. Um, if somebody prioritizes the idea of an outpatient procedure, um, or they really are turned off by the idea of having to 
uh, maintain their therapy, whether that's through programming adjustments or getting their battery replaced or recharged uh, on a regular basis. On the flip side, who might be better served with DBS? So as I mentioned, sometimes essential tremor can affect the head or the voice. And if that is the primary concern, I think we are still better off heading in the direction of DBS, as we know that we have good outcomes for head and voice tremor with bilateral DBS treatment. I think it is possible with focused ultrasound, and we may learn in the future that we can reliably treat head and voice tremor, but right now, I think it is uncertain to what degree you're going to get improvement in those things with focused ultrasound. So if that's the primary concern, I would steer somebody towards DBS. If you want, if you prioritize maximal tremor control above all other considerations, I think DBS is still the way to go. If you have pre-existing gait difficulties, again, we talked about that. I think DBS might be better. If the idea of having a risk of a non-reversible side effect is important to a patient, then I think DBS should be considered. And if you need, for whatever reason, or highly want to treat both sides of the brain simultaneously, then DBS is the only way to go. Uh, both sides can be treated with focused ultrasound, but currently we have to separate that treatment in time by at least nine months. And really, we want to see how you do after the first side, what kind of side effects did or did not develop, and whether it is, is safe to do the second side. So what would you get at VCU neurosurgery uh, for essential tremor? Well, we have, even though this procedure we've only started doing in September of last year, we have been doing surgical interventions for movement disorders for decades, uh, primarily with DBS, thalamotomy before that. So we are really able to tailor a, a treatment plan to each patient's unique situation. I mean, the program began in the 90s, and, and at that time was one of, one of only a few major centers doing DBS. We've done over 700 patients. We have a very comprehensive program that's not just includes the neurologists and the neurosurgeons, um, but also nurse coordinators. We work closely with the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, speech, and so forth. So for example, everybody who undergoes focused ultrasound will get an evaluation from physical therapy largely to assess their gait ahead of time. Um, so that we know where your baseline is. And if you fall off that baseline, we can get you plugged into the therapy that you need. <clears throat> so patient would get a very detailed discussion of pros and cons of each therapy um, in order to help them make the best informed decision. And that's different than many places where they're either only doing DBS or what we're gonna see, I think more and more in the future is more places that are only doing focused ultrasound. Um, let's see, what time is it? 12, we have time. So this uh, we this is a very nice video that was made of our very first focused ultrasound patient put together by VCU. I thought it would be nice to show to you. This is available on the web. So if you have patients that would want to consider this, you can refer them to this. Um, but I thought this was a nice video to, to take a look at. I had them for 30 years but I didn't even know it. And then the fire department said we had to have a physical every year, it's mandatory. And the doctor told me, looked at me and said, uh, you got essential tremors. I said, what's that? I don't think I'd ever heard of them at that time. I actually met Ross a few years before we did the procedure. Uh, and he had been referred because he had tremor that was bothersome to him patient typically has essential tremor, which is a hereditary disease. But it starts out as a, a minor tremor that just progresses over time, and it can come to interfere with all their activities of daily living. Every year it got worse. I couldn't do hardly nothing before. I was just, I mean, like that all the time, both hands. Uh, I shook so bad that I couldn't hardly function. We have these people come in, uh, sit down and talk to us. We look at how their tremor affects their lives. We um, scale out their tremor to see how severe it is. Uh, and then we talk to them about their options. So if the patient is not responding to the medication, then we consider a surgical procedure. 
and focused ultrasound is one of those procedures. And focused ultrasound is a combination of new technologies to do the old procedure. So we're still creating a lesion in the brain, um, but we're doing it in a safer and more accurate way. The way that this works is that there are about a thousand different individual sources of ultrasound energy. And they all travel and meet together at one point, kind of like if you hold a magnifying glass over a leaf and you can burn a very specific spot. Similarly, no one of those individual ultrasound energy beams has enough energy to cause any damage. But when they all meet together at that one point, enough energy uh, adds together to create a lesion. So I knew that this would be a, a, a good choice for him because the tremor had gotten worse. So it is an outpatient procedure, and we do it with the patient awake in the scanner, so there's no need for general anesthesia. The first thing you do is cut all your hair off. <laughs> I got back problems, and they took care of me. They patted my back down to work. I didn't feel a thing through the whole procedure. What makes focus ultrasound sort of more instantaneously gratifying is how immediately we see the effects. Everything went perfect. They, uh, about every 30 minutes, they'd hand me a pad and a pencil and tell me to do a circle. And the first time I was coming off with a pad, even, I couldn't even make a half a circle. And about another 30 minutes, they handed it to me and everybody in there applauded because I made the perfect little circle like they wanted. So the, again, this is, they, they showed up in the morning, you know, several hours later, their tremor is, is, is significantly better. It's really that team approach and that very careful approach that we take. We are really dedicated to making this the best, safest procedure possible for the patient. When they took me out, I was so excited. When she came down the hall, I grabbed her and hugged her neck. I told her, I said, you give me my life back. And in a sense, she did. It's amazing, totally amazing. I go to the gym three times a week, even now. I can go an hour on the treadmill. I refuse to stop. But I'm a nut at it. I've been doing it for 25 years, and I ain't gonna quit till I, till I can't move, I'll quit. <laughs>
um, but they're very small. And uh, that lends itself very well to applications like this, where you only want to create a very small lesion. Um, tumors, as you can imagine, are, you know, are they, we have other minimally invasive tools that I think are more effective in, in, in terms of destroying tumors, something, for example, called laser interstitial therapy. Um, but that being said, there are there is another form of focused ultrasound. So this that we've talked about today, which makes uh, lesions, is high frequency focused ultrasound. There is also low frequency focused ultrasound. And one of the fascinating applications of that is that it can be used to selectively open the blood brain barrier in an anatomic way. And this and and there are active trials underway now. So you can imagine the idea of then delivering chemotherapeutic immunotherapeutic agents that where the one of the major barriers is getting across the blood brain barrier this could be a, a, a very effective tool for doing that so so people are now already delivering uh, chemotherapeutic agents to brain tumors by selectively opening the blood brain barrier there's also a, a bit a bit murkier uh understanding there are ways of delivering focused ultrasound that we think modulate the immune system. So there are trials underway to try to focally modulate the immune system in, in the environment of a tumor that, that is thought to have a beneficial effect on the immune system's ability to shut down a tumor progression. So while I don't think it's going to be the, the best tool for literally like burning out tumor, there are some very exciting applications in tumor that uh that are a more sophisticated approach. Thank you very much. Yep, Dr. Sun. So thank you very much for coming to Neuron Medicine. It's always fun to have other um, experts come and visit us. Um, so a couple of questions. There's obviously a difference in the side effect profile between deep brain stimulation and your focused ultrasound. I wonder what your thoughts on why it's so different. Is it a focusing problem? And then a second question, um, what do you think, the, why does this work? Are you killing neurons? Are you getting microvascular injury, all of the above? Um, <laughs> that, that's a great question. Oh, so let, they're both good questions. So um, the first one, <clears throat> so we, It has to do with the, the irreversibility of it. So with, with DBS, we are very quick to adjust stimulation. So we off the bat, we have four different contacts we can pit, pick with an implanted electrode and uh, in, in, in order to deliver stimulation. And we very quickly zero in on the one that's giving us the best benefit and no side effects. Even before, we do that even in the operating room while, when the patient's awake. And so uh, I think you can get gait disturbance and you certainly can get paresthesias with DBS, but it doesn't, you never really keep it on those settings for the most part to really see, you know, how that may manifest itself because it's just so easily worked around. Um, and it's extraordinarily rare to get a, a permanent lesional effect from just putting the electrode in that's permanent. It's, because the lesion, the electrode itself is about one, it's about 1.2 millimeters in diameter. And so the, the, the physical damage the lead does by, by uh, going into the brain is, is small compared to what focused ultrasound does. Um, so that's one. And then the second question is, how do we think it's working? Yeah. So the shorter answer is no one is, is a hundred percent sure uh, still. Um, but I think you, you are certainly creating um, uh, a disruption in the transmission of signals through a specific motor pathway. And I think many of us think that that is more likely because of damage to white matter, right? So you're actually, you're, you're causing microvascular injury, you're, you're literally cooking tissue, right? So you're, you're, you're um, uh, uh, denaturing the proteins in, in a very focal way. Uh, and it's probably, it's probably the degree to which you are disrupting white matter pathways that connect key nodes that then you are in terms of 
uh, removing a certain group of neurons within the thalamus. Although it could be a, it could be both. I think we don't really definitively know. Thanks, Doctor. Since uh, since essential tremor is a progressive disease, do you ever see after treatment reprogression where people symptoms start to get worse years after treatment? Yes, it does happen, and people do come back for a, a repeat treatment. Um, or uh, I think there have been patients that had an initial focused ultrasound and then went on to get DBS on the same side. Um, I think there's a, I think, you know, the, the majority of patients see a durable effect, but there are some for whom it fades. And this, you know, this is likely related to disease progression. And so uh, I didn't get into this in the talk, but there's, there's some there's some data that suggests that there are two trajectories that patients with essential tremor tend to follow. Either they tend to be a sort of steady, linear, progressive increase in disability, and those patients tend to be younger at onset, or they take a more uh, exponential uh, course where it progresses rapidly in an exponential way, and those tend to be patients that first are symptomatic. Uh, at an older age, and so it may be, it may be that one versus the other is more durable with focus ultrasound. Um, I don't think we have enough data to really parse that out and know. Are there any other questions from the audience here? It does not look like there are any questions in the chat or QA, but if there's anybody that has any questions online, please feel free to enter them in. Otherwise, we are finished with our medicine grand rounds and would just like to thank our presenter. Uh, this was a really incredible presentation. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the time. And again, if anybody wants to chat about any of this further or have questions, don't hesitate to uh, shoot shoot me an email. And I'll send out the slides. Thanks, thanks so, so much. much thanks so much, Dr. Koch.